Good evening. My name is Don Medley, and I'm the manager of government and community relations at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Welcome to Friends of Science sponsored Science in the Theater lecture. Thank you very much for your interest in the scientific discovery and technolo technology development going on at Berkeley Lab. We owe a special thank you to the sponsors, the co sponsors of tonight's event UC Berkeley. Chabot Space and Science Center, the Exploratorium, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkeley, Lawrence Hall of Science, and the science departments of the high schools at Albany, Berkeley, and Oakland. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Cyrus Wadia. Cyrus has spent the last five years at Cal and at Berkeley Lab in pursuit, in pursuit of a new low-cost photovoltaic technology using met metal sulfides. Leveraging his knowledge in both the natural and the social sciences, Cyrus's research covers both exhaustible resource economics and aqueous chemistry of nanoparticles. His work has resulted in two provisional patents and three peer-reviewed journal articles highlighting the strength of a multidisciplinary approach to solving the complicated issues of renewable energy supply. His work was a first of a kind at UC Berkeley and has spawned a pervasive interest in basic science research informed by fundam fundamental economics and guided by market potential. In 2006, Cyrus founded the UC Berkeley PV Idea Lab, a collaboration of all photovoltaic research activity on campus. And in 2008, he was named by the chancellor as the vice president of Idea Labs. Prior to his doctoral studies, Cyrus spent over seven years in Silicon Valley launching new, launching new technology to market. Most recently, he has demonstrated his entrepreneurial skills as the founder of a, bo a boutique internet services startup specializing in complex data analysis. This company has grown to six employees and supports over 500 users. Cyrus earned his PhD in energy and resources from UC Berkeley and holds both an MS and an SB in chemical engineering from MIT. Will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Wadia. <laughs> Thank you, Don, and thank you to the rest of the LBNL organizers for putting on such a great event, and of course to the sponsors for supporting. Um, but most of all, thank you for coming. It's a real thrill and honor to be here to talk about this topic. Um, we have a very challenging topic, as you can tell by the title. You know, we're going to try to talk about how we actually put solar photovoltaics in the hands of seven b billion people on Earth. Um, but before we do, I want to take you through a little bit of an overview of what we're going to discuss and how we're going to navigate this. All of you are here because you've already recognized that solar is an important piece of a clean energy future that we're all hopeful for. But a lot of the existing technologies and directions of research may fall a little bit short of a goal if the, our goal is truly to be very pervasive with solar photovoltaics. Now, the first thing I want to point out is to make sure that you know, we're all grounded. So we're going to be talking about solar for the electricity markets, not for use as transportation or solar to fuel. We're going to be talking primarily about two key criteria. And I hope that by the end of this discussion, you all go away thinking about two, these two things, which is can we make things cheap and can we make things fast? And those are the two key criteria that will be the foundation for this entire presentation. From there, we'll move on to existing technologies, namely silicon and thin films, and we'll discuss those in detail with respect to those criteria and try to understand where the limitations and the potentials are. From there, we'll move into new approaches, and I'll create sort of a case for why we should be looking at new approaches and move into some of our research at Lawrence Berkeley Lab and UC Berkeley on these very exciting nanoparticle solar cells. So, 20% of the world lives without electricity. And being that the world population is roughly 6.7 billion people, we're talking about over 1 billion people. Vinod Khosla is a venture capitalist and entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. Many of you probably have heard him. He is uh, a leader in this space in terms of investing in clean tech. And he has an interesting quote too, which is that 500 million people today enjoy the lifestyle that 9 billion are going to want by 2050. 
So there are really two categories here, and I want to draw that distinction up front. There is the developed world, where we all sit, and there is the developing world. And these are two very different categories. So when we talk about bringing solar in a pervasive way to the entire globe, we really have to be trying to meet both of the needs of the developing and the developed. And we care about the developing primarily for climate change. I think that's probably one that is on everybody's mind, but also poverty alleviation and pulling people out of these kind of desperate situations. So I want to create a framework that addresses both. And to start off, I'm showing you this picture because last fall I went to China and to visit a rural village out in the Yunnan province. And this village has about 60 or 70 people living there. If you were to go there probably about two months ago, there would be about two feet of snow on the ground. It's very high in the mountains, about three hours away from any paved road. And these people, for many years, have lived without electricity. You can see their dwellings are pretty modest. Now, their earning potential is roughly 300 US dollars per year. And that's a, that's a best case scenario for them. They would do that through agriculture or raising livestock. But really, the important point here is that they, um, they don't have electricity, but electricity would help them in terms of their kind of daily existence or pulling themselves out of poverty. So in this particular case, they have many needs, as you can tell. But our ability to solve their problems with technology may not be limited by our imagination but rather it may be limited by our resources. And I'm going to pause here for a second and talk a little bit broadly. You know, we're not out here trying to say that solar is the be-all, end-all solution. There are many different energy technologies. You've, you've heard of several, wind, hydroelectric, etc. And there will hopefully be movement in all of these technologies so that in the future, a village like this could basically benefit from all of them. But since we're here to talk about solar, Let's, for argument's sake, say, let's try to put solar in the hands of 7 billion people. You know, these people are probably better off than some, but w worse off than most. And so these people became my case study. When I went there, I was hoping to align the technology that we're working on at Lawrence Berkeley Lab with the needs of people like these. And in kind of exploring what their needs were, I believe that we found a potential solution that could address that. So let's get into the solar question and talk about those two metrics I spelled out front. There's two, cost and scale. So cost is how cheap can we make it? And scale is how fast? Now, if you're going to address this problem for these people, this is another image of some of the people I met in this village. Very nice people, they sit around this open cook stove in this drafty house. But when I discussed sort of their needs and what their potential to pay would be, in an uns unsubsidized case, we're talking about five cents a kilowatt hour. And just kind of as a rule of thumb, PG&E, the average customer, you, is probably paying about 12 to 14 cents a kilowatt hour. So if we can get to five cents a kilowatt hour, we're probably addressing some of the cost issue. But we're going to get back to that in a more substantive way. Let's talk for a second about scale. So last year, by the end of the year, we had a cumulative production capability in all the photovoltaic plants on the globe of 6.85 gigawatts. And to give you an idea of what that means, 6.85 gigawatts. So if we used all that production, added no new production this year, and just rolled out solar cells, we could produce by the end of the year 6.85 gigawatts of power. New York City, on a hot summer day, uses about 12 gigawatts. So, what we are able to do after several decades of building out this capacity is service about 50% of New York City's needs. Another way to think about this is if we rolled out all those solar cells and just kind of laid them side by side, they would cover an area the size of Berkeley. So, you know, this is a familiar map to you. This is about the area that it would cover. So you've got to pause to think here for a second and say, well, you know, that doesn't seem like a lot. Some may view that as very optimistic. We've been growing very fast. 
And some may view that as, wow, you know, we've worked for five decades on this technology and this is where we are today. It's a little surprising. It was probably surprising to me the first time I learned that as well. But also some of you are in the audience probably thinking, well, doesn't this just resolve itself over time? You know, we just continue to grow. The industry has grown at 50% plus a year. So wouldn't that imply that over time this resolves itself? Well, let's look at that. So this is a chart to show what the PV industry's contribution to total worldwide electricity would be in 10 years' time if we were to grow at over 50% a year. This big yellow kind of triangle shape is total worldwide electricity consumed. And you can see it's on the order of 20s of thousands of terawatt hours. This little slice of maroon, that's your PV. That's your PV industry after 10 years, additional years, of 50 plus percent growth, which is phenomenal. Anybody who's investing in this space would like to get into that type of market. So, you know, it, and, and the last thing I'll say is that this is 2.6 percent of the market. Okay, so that's still a lot. And like I said earlier, we're going to be contributing to this, these global problems with other technologies. But, you know, quite honestly, that just might not be fast enough. You know, think about what meaningful time frame we want to deploy this type of technology. You know, for whatever cause you're interested in. Is it climate change? Is it resource uh, procurement? Is it national security? Is it poverty alleviation? You know, whatever your cause, this is not happening in a meaningful time frame. And we may have to change the way we think. So, how do we think? The culture in the photovoltaic industry is deeply embedded in one number. I guarantee you, if you guys walked around a boardroom or walked into a meeting at a solar company, this would be the target. This is the bullseye. It's probably on a whiteboard right now at the 150 startups that are in the Silicon Valley of solar. So what does this number mean? It's a dollar a watt. So you hear this all the time in the, the press and the news and when the you know, people starting these companies pitch their investors. They, they, this is their target. So a watt is a measure of power, and you know, clearly you can kind of picture what a dollar watt might mean, but I'm going to describe it to you in maybe a, an example that you'll, you'll understand it's close to home. So if you today wanted to install solar on your roof in, in Berkeley, a residential solar system, it might look like this. You would probably need about three to four kilowatt, that type of solution, and your install cost would be roughly around $30,000. Okay, so where does that number come from? Basically, it comes from this dollar a watt number. The installed cost today for a solar cell system residential is $8 a watt. And $8 a watt includes a lot of different components. It's not just the solar panels. That is actually, remarkably, it's only half of the installed cost. The rest goes into your inverter or into the installation labor or the mounting. There's tons of things that go into this. And we're talking about a dollar watt. So let's, for argument's sake, say we take that slice that's $4 a watt. That's just your panel. If we take that slice from $4 a watt down to $1 a watt, which is what the companies working on this are trying to do, you're going to get down to $5 a watt total install. This is great. We shave almost half of the cost. So now 18750 might look a little bit more palpable. Now, when you think about you know, okay, how do I place $5 a watt into the context of the problem we're trying to solve? I think what you really need to do is look at separate geographic locations and think about what it, does it mean to be in grid parity. And so I'm going to walk you through, it's a complicated chart, but you know, we'll, we'll take it one step at a time. So the first thing I want to show you about this chart, this is a chart put out by a colleague at Signet Solar. They manufacture amorphous silicon. And I think there's a very good representation of what we're trying to say. So on the left-hand side, you see these numbers? They're US dollars per kilowatt hour. So what they represent is what the competitive cost is for energy or electricity in a given location. So whether it be coal or nuclear or hydro, this is going to vary by geographic location. What, what is also going to vary by geographic location is the amount of insulation hitting that area. So the amount of power you could actually get out of a solar cell. This is sometimes referred to as capacity factor, but you know, for argument's sake, just note that it's sunnier on this side and it, the 
the options for uh, non-solar resources are more expensive on this side. So then what we can do is we can plot by country, China, India, Greece, Spain. The U.S. is split up into several major states. And for each of those markets, the size of the bubble represents how big that market is. So it should be no surprise that the biggest bubble you see here is China. But of course, like I said, the states like California as a state is much larger than Greece, probably a little larger than Spain. Okay, so now you've got your bearings. Take a look at the right-hand column. And what you see here is that these are the installed costs for solar. And it's a trade-off. So as you move in this parameter space, at different dollars per watt installed, we just talked about $8, maybe going down to 5 right? So where are we? We're right, right about here. This is what we're going to capture. So if they're successful at getting us down to a dollar a watt, we're still in a subsidized market. Where do we have to go if we want to be in an unsubsidized market here in the U.S.? We have to be down and installed around $2 a watt, right? So you can look at the, the parameter space and make some decisions. Well, you know, if I want to capture just, you know, a few of these outliers here, I know what my cost needs to be. If I need to capture more, I know what my cost needs to be. But as we move down, you sweep up more markets, be it states or countries. But $2 a watt, that's an interesting number, right? Because we're not close to that yet. We can get there. But who do we leave out? India and China. And so when you come back to this, you say, well, that would be a nice point to get to. But that's not a finish line. That's a starting point. And if we're serious about addressing this problem to 7 billion people, we have to be serious about the cost of what it's going to be in India and China. And that cost comes out to be about 75 cents a watt. So let's review. We said today you can buy solar around here, $8 installed. If the solar manufacturers are successful at achieving their goals, we'll probably get down to here. This will go down a little bit more, and I'll explain why. But if we're really serious about an unsubsidized market in the U.S., we have to be looking at this number, $2 a watt. And for you, what that would mean is on your roof, $7,500. That sounds a little bit more reasonable if we can get there. But what happens when we move from here back to our friends in China, in that Yunnan province? That actually, at 75 cents a watt, looks a lot harder to get to from where we are today. And I'll point out one other thing. Their energy needs are much less than ours. Right? They're not running big air conditioners or refrigerators. They just want some basic things, lights, TV. And their power needs are so low that we can get, if we can get them here, at, if we can get them a technology at 75 cents a watt, we can actually get that installed at $225. Now, remember what I said, their annual earning potential in that village was $300. So we're very, you know, we're kind of close to where the edge would be. But, you know, these things can be financed as well. But the idea is that if you want to put this in the hands of a billion people today that don't have electricity, you cannot scale, you know, some sort of subsidy to get it in their hands. You have to make the technology cost effective where they can afford it and they can actually use it. So that's the backdrop. Now, fast enough and cheap enough. I think, I think we've made that point. So let's go ahead and look at some existing technologies and really understand where we are today. Let's start with silicon. Now, the majority of you are very familiar with silicon solar cells because Anybody who's kind of looked at a solar cell has most likely been looking at a silicon panel. It's over 90% of the market. Do you know that the very first solar cell created at Bell Labs in the 50s still works today? It's pretty incredible. So, and when you go out and buy your solar panels, you're going to get a tremendous warranty, um, 30 plus years. Other than a Tempur-Pedic memory foam mattress, I don't know where else you can get that type of <laughs> warranty. So, if you look at where we started, we started with very specific applications. Satellites, the space age, this is when the technology was about hundreds of thousands of dollars a watt. So, you know, we're talking about $8 a watt now, but back then it was very expensive. So it slowly crept into the market. First you got the solar into the space. Today they actually use different technologies up there, but they started with silicon. Then silicon kind of moved its way into these high power remote markets like uh, remote teleco stations. 
and then off-grid, rural type applications. And then through very aggressive policies in Germany and, and Japan, we saw a push. We saw a push in the late 90s, early 2000 time frame, and this stuff moved into the market for the grid. And as you guys may or may not be familiar, there's a lot of still very aggressive policy out there, subsidies, tax incentives, for us to get this basically tied to the grid. So what's the vision? If the vision is $1 a watt, which is what all the manufacturers want, this is what, they, this is what their future looks like. Now this is a, a picture taken from Nellis Air Force Base, but I like it because it really does represent where the solar manufacturers see this going. They see huge installations out in the desert. This is an inset kind of give you a bird's eye view. Huge installations of these high efficiency or moderate efficiency solar panels out in the desert that feed into a centralized, basically a grid system. So it pipes the electricity to wherever we need it. Now, you know, if we, if we want to talk about silicon making it to 7 billion people, right, you know, we just saw another picture in the Yunnan province of China that you, know, you would probably be surprised if something like this were to show up there. So this goes back to what I was saying about maybe we have to change our way of thinking, but in order for us to truly evaluate silicon as a potential, we have to start at the beginning. So this is what a silicon solar cell looks like. The very beginning, sand. So silicon is derived from silicon dioxide, which is commonly known as sand, quartz, it's a form of rock. And this is basically the material. So when you look at this, right, what you're thinking is, wow, that's really abundant. It's got to be cheap, right? I mean, it's sand. We should be able to make a lot of this. So let's step through the process. And by doing that, we'll see where some of the, the potential bottlenecks are. All right, so to make a silicon feedstock for solar cells, we have to start with sand or quartz. And what we do then is we reduce this in an arc furnace. Basically what we're doing is putting a lot of energy to break that silicon oxygen bond. And in fact, let me put this up here. Silicon dioxide, SiO2, that bond is very strong. So in order to break that, we have to add energy. And that energy is at that number, 24 kilowatt hours per kilogram. That must not mean anything to anybody in the audience, but as a point of comparison, if you wanted to do the same thing to reduce iron oxide to iron, it would be about two kilowatt hours per kilogram, one order of magnitude lower. So that should give you an appreciation, at least for some common metals, how energy intensive that is. Okay, so you reduce that, and what happens? You get what we call metallurgical grade silicon. 98% purity, sounds pretty good, right? It's about $1 to $2 a kilogram. We make just millions of tons of this, but it's just not good enough. We need it even more pure. And the reason for that is basically every solar cell has kind of a property that's called absorption coefficient. And silicon, unfortunately, has a relatively low absorption coefficient when compared to some of, you know, its material colleagues. So what that what basically what that means in simple terms is that you have to use more material. So the thickness has to go up. But anytime you increase the thickness, the chance of a charge, in our case electrons or holes, to get out of a solar cell device, the actual physics of that device, the chance of that, the probability of that goes down if you make it thicker and thicker. So in order to reduce that probability of losing your charges, and getting the power out that you set out to, you've got to make it more pure. Give those electrons and holes a nice pathway. So what we do then is we do some basically interesting chemical processing known as the Siemens process, and we come out with what we call semiconductor grade or photovoltaic grade polysilicon. And the manufacturing cost at the end of the, the road is $25 a kilogram. And you can see the volume is much lower. So we go from $1 to about $25. Again, one order of magnitude. Now, we think that we have tricks to use the metallurgical grade. We think we have tricks to reduce the number of nines. And there's going to be some savings there. But let's, for argument's sake, say this is what we're working with. And let's see how that plays out. 
So this, this is basically, now you've got, you've got the semiconductor PV grade silicon here. The very next thing you have to do is you have to put it into a module, a panel. And you make the cells, but then you have to string them together. You've got to put different materials to encapsulate it, like glass, et cetera, some polymer. You have to do some other encapsulation, and then you have your module. Now, the tricky thing is, if I could go back to one thing I said earlier, silicon, we need to make it a little bit thick. And, but because we make it thick, it limits our form factor. It limits our creativity with how we can package it. We're pretty much confined to a system like this. And there is cost related to each of these. After that, you have to get it on the roof. There's mounts, there's other hardware, there's labor. And if you're in the US, you're feeding to the grid or not, you're using an alternating current. And what comes out of your solar cell is direct current. So there's what's called an inverter to move it from direct to alternating. So let's look at the cost. We said we were going to start with the silicon. That comes out to be $1.25 a watt. To do all the manufacturing and encapsulation, you add another $2.18 a watt. So the total there is a little less than $4 a watt to that. Inverter adds about 59 cents. And then the labor for insulation is about $1.70. And then there's this catch-all. All other costs associated with it, shockingly large, $2.40 a watt. Comes out with that $8 a watt, what we started this conversation with. So if we do a hypothetical experiment, let's say we get this for free. You know, we come up with some new technology, invent some new way to get that silicon basically essentially at zero cost, which would be fantastic you're still then saddled with all of this. You're still then saddled with that $4 a watt. And remember where we want to go. We want to go to two for, for here at home, and then we want to go to 75 cents for abroad and developing countries. So really, for silicon to succeed, they depend on these guys making large improvements as well. They depend on the installation cost to go way down. They depend on the inverter cost to go way down and all these miscellaneous. So I'm not saying it's a non-starter, but what I am saying is that those two things have to happen in tandem. And until they do, it's really hard to imagine silicon as being sort of the low-cost leader in this space. OK. Well, there's some good news. These thin films, right? You guys have heard of these, some local companies. Cattell, First Solar, Cad Cadmium Indium, Copper Indium Gallium Diselenide, that's Mia Soleil, Nanosolar Cylindra, these are known as SIG cells. And first I want to talk about the chart. So this is just a cartoon. Again, it's encapsulated just like I showed you with the silicon, but because it's thinner, you can see this guy pinching it, this cartoon man pinching it between his thumb and finger. You use less material, so all of a sudden it opens up a whole new ball game in terms of that packaging. You can do it on plastic, you can do it on foil, you can make it flexible, you can do lots of interesting things. You can process it faster, you can process it cheaper, you can use roll to roll processing. These are all the things this industry talks about. It's great. Less material, faster processing. We're moving towards that solution that we want. First Solar just announced that they're at $1 a watt. That is an incredible achievement. They already hit it. So they hit their bull bullseye, and now they're moving down off of that. And they're moving fast. They're manufacturing faster than any other thin film player. So if I do a kind of rough calculation, what that brings us to is roughly $6 a watt installed for a residential US customer. And if I really want to get clever, I can say, well, why don't we just take out the inverter, stick with DC, why don't we figure out something different with the packaging, make it real kind of bare bones, cut all the insulation costs out? Then maybe I could take that, this product over to our friends in China and those you know, villages, and maybe I can get a distributed solution that's about $2 a watt. It's not quite the 75 cents a watt, but it's a step in the right direction, not just a small step. This is a huge step in the right direction. So the question is, are we done? Well. Not quite. All these materials that go into these thin films, unfortunately, tend to be very rare relative, if you're looking at geologic scales. So 
tellurium, indium, gallium, selenium. These are strained elements in terms of just the markets for those elements. And the ability to ramp up the production is kind of difficult to imagine because they're mined as what's called secondary elements. So they're the byproduct of zinc or copper mines. So the story was sounding so good, but now we have to really think hard. Okay, the thin film guys probably could get it cheap enough. Okay, they could probably make it fast enough so they're meeting our criteria, but can they put it in the hands of 7 billion people? So we looked at this. We tried to quantify how much solar you can get out of different material compounds. And I'm going to walk you through this chart kind of one step at a time. We looked at 23 different semiconducting compounds, iron sulfide, copper sulfide, copper oxide, so on and so forth, to CAD tell. What we did is we said, what if we could extract all of the resource? Every year, a certain amount of cadmium and tellurium and indium and gallium, every year some of that's mined. What if we took all of it, made solar cells out of it, kind of state of the art, best case scenario? We're talking 20 plus percent efficiency. So I was looking at the best case scenario, use the least amount of material for the highest efficiency. So that would say, this is sort of the optimum. If we took all that material in a given year, and that's what the gold bars represent, and that's what I want you to focus on, how much electricity would we get out? And that's what this y-axis shows. This is annual electricity in terawatt hours, and it's an order of magnitude chart. So these are big numbers we're talking about. For, to help guide your eye, I put two more lines on this chart. U.S. consumption, and that's 4,000 terawatt hours a year, and worldwide consumption, that's 17,000 terawatt hours a year. Okay. So... We did the analysis, and let's take a look at our materials. cad tell. It would fall two to three orders of magnitude lower than U.S. consumption if we just used annual production numbers. Okay. So that's not a criticism. I, I mean, I'm very excited about the cad tell progress dollar a watt. I think it's a phenomenal business model, too, for this 50% growth industry that we're in. But again, remember the question we're trying to answer, 7 billion people. SIGS comes out right here, just a shade over U.S. consumption. Crystalline silicon, shade over worldwide consumption. It's a little surprising. So then look what happens. There's about seven materials that appear to be better than crystalline silicon in terms of raw abundance. So when we move all the way to the end of the chart, we see two of my favorites, iron sulfide and copper sulfide. And anybody who interacts with me knows that, you know, one of every five sentences has one of these materials <laughs> listed. <laughs> so look at this. It's, it's way off the chart. So is copper sulfide and so is other, you know, copper oxide, zinc phosphide. So what happened here? These materials may have gotten overlooked based on being on the wrong side of history. And when I say that, they're on the wrong side of research and development history. Okay, but we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So this was a surprising result. And this is what sort of pointed me down this road to say, well, we, we need to look at one more thing. We need to look at cost. So what we can do now is we can look at that exact analysis, index it to crystalline silicon, because that's the market leader. This is this axis. And then we can also index it against cost, just for extraction cost. There's no way to really know what the processing cost of this is going to be for all these compounds. The only thing we can do is start with it, the extraction cost. And we'd, we'd do a scatter plot, all indexed to silicon. And where you want to be is in this upper right-hand quadrant. Where you don't want to be is in the lower left. And what you see here is there's kind of an interesting separation, you know, again, cad tell here, SIGs, you know, on this chart it doesn't look too bad. But look what happens here. We have amorphous silicon, zinc phosphide, copper sulfide, copper oxide, and we have iron sulfide way off the chart. <laughs> so when we, when we kind of realized this, we said, you know, we, we've got to go make an iron sulfide solar cell. And that's what we've been trying to do for many years. And but there are other candidates that are equally important. So what we think we've done is found an answer to the abundance question, which is 
put it into 7 billion people's, the hands of 7 billion people, work in this upper right hand quadrant. We think we've also addressed the cost issue by saying, well, we start off at a very low cost. That's the base, baseline. So that gives us hope that we can make this at the 75 cent a watt level install. But there's one tricky part, which you guys are all familiar with now, which is once you make the solar cell, the panel, there are all those other pieces, right? How do we get away from the big balance of systems, the, the you know, installation costs and all of this? And so we have to add one more dimension. If we go back to our chart of cost and scale, there's a, an area of research that helps address both of those, and that's nanotech. Now, I'm going to give a, a brief introduction into nanotech in a second, but what I want to say is that nanotech addresses the cost and scale, most importantly, by allowing us to process very, very cheaply. And when we think about making solar cells with this material, what we're imagining is rolling them off like a newspaper, inks that just print this stuff down. And maybe we can make it so cheap that the lifetime, which has always been an issue with solar cells for large grid scale installations, uh, may not be such an important factor and may help us avoid some of the, the encapsulation costs. But a little bit more about nano. So really, this is an absolutely phenomenal area of research. We've seen so much progress in the last decade because basically we've now been able to see things on such a small scale and by being able to see them we can manipulate them and start doing just really really interesting science. So for those who don't know what a nano is, um, a nanometer would be 10 to the minus 9 meters and you know just kind of a point of reference this upper image is a strand of hair at a very high magnification. And that strand of hair has about 100,000 nanometers across the, the diameter. So that's a lot of nanometers. The, the bottom picture is a red blood cell, and that's about 1,000 nanometers wide. So now you're getting an appreciation of how small, really small, a nanometer is. And you know, we're going to talk about how we can make particles of these copper sulfide or these iron sulfide or other semiconducting compounds at about you know, five plus nanometers. So, very small. What happens is, when you make it small, there are a lot of interesting things you can do. One of the common ones that people talk about is a physical property, um, the melting point. You know, as you make it smaller, you can depress the melting point. So, if you're going to process it by using some melting, you could probably process it much cheaper because the energy input's lower. Another one that's specific to photovoltaic solar is engineering the band gap. So, now, we can play these tricks where we say we're going to identify the band gap that's ideal for our solar cell and that is an area, the band gap energy is the area that's the most important for knowing how much energy you can get out of a material. And now I can, sh I can play with that and honestly just engineer it so it's like perfectly aligned with the solar spectrum. But the one I like the most is purity. So think about a real big block of silicon or any other material that you're interested in. As you get smaller and smaller, the probability of having defects or imperfections goes down. So what that means is the probability of having a very pure material goes up. Now we talked about the purity as being a very key issue for silicon, but across the board, it doesn't hurt. If it's more pure, that's better. And in a particular case, iron sulfide, we are revisiting work there that had been worked on in the 80s by several really, really talented scientists in Germany. But the single problem they ran into was they couldn't make it pure enough. And they made it very pure. But any small metal sulfide defect, any other phase of iron sulfide, will kill the properties of your photovoltaic. So we think we can win by making it smaller. We think we can win on processing cost by making it smaller. And so we got into the lab and rolled up our sleeves and, and got going on it. So the next thing I want to do is show you a quick video um, about how we make this. So now I want to take you from nanoparticle to solar cell, finished solar cell. And I'm going to show you a quick video in, in two parts. But the first thing I want to show you is a, a colleague of mine, John Owen, recorded his uh, synthesis of a cadmium selenide recipe. And 
It's a little fuzzy. It'll be more clear when I start it, but it goes pretty fast. So I want to show you a few things first. The first thing is, th this is our chemistry, by the way. This is how we do it. And I hope you get appreciation for how simple um, this is in sort of visual context. It's very challenging, however, to get the right recipe. And that's sort of the, the science behind it. But this is uh, what's known as a stir plate and hot plate. Um, it allows us to agitate our reaction. This manifold here is a heating mantle, allows us to heat our reaction. So we can agitate, we can heat. This is a three-neck flask. It's about the size of my fist. And what you don't see, what's cut off from the pitcher, is what's known as a condenser tube. It allows us to flow um, inert gas. It allows us to pull a vacuum on the reaction. On one side, we can monitor the temperature. On the other side of that three-neck flask, we can inject. And what you, it's hard to tell here, but there's a syringe. And that blue, uh, that blue spot is, is John's finger as he's about to inject some reactants. So what do we do? We basically we mix all this stuff together. And now you know all the parameters we can play with. And you can see there's a lot of combinations here. We mix this together, and this is how we grow a nanoparticle. So let's start the video. <clears throat> what you're going to see next is a close-up of that three-neck flask as the reaction's going. And what's absolutely fascinating about this is that you're going to see the color change. And what you're actually witnessing is the growth of the nanoparticles going from a very small size, just single nanometers, to you know, five to ten nanometers. So you, it starts with sort of this pale yellow color, and you can see it get more reddish and orange. So what's happening there is you're actually growing the nanoparticles, and it's changing the optical properties. So the, the particles themselves, they emit re-emit light at different wavelengths as they get bigger. This is one of those neat properties of nanoparticles I was talking about before. So now what we can do is we can say, well, I can visually see when it's the right size, so I can actually cut that reaction off when I need it and make a particle the way I want to. So we have these uh, you know, interesting abilities to manipulate these semiconductors in a way that has never been before possible. So what we do next, and I borrowed a clip from ABC7 who uh, filmed us making some iron sulfide devices. What we do next is we take that material that we get from the reaction, we clean it, we do some processing, and then we, we what we call drop cast on a glass substrate. And this glass substrate has a, conductive, a transparent conductive oxide. And what you're going to see next is dropping it on this plate, it spins, and it makes a film. And this is how we make a solar cell. This is actually iron sulfide mixed with a polymer, P3HT. We spin it, they edited out the, you know, the depe deposition of the contacts, but what you're, you're seeing now is a close-up of one of our solar cells, actually three of our solar cells. And these are each one inch, so this is this big. What each of these chips represents is a thin film of those nanoparticles, and each of these pads are aluminum, and they're a conductive a metal, so we can actually extract the charge out. This is how you make a solar cell. But what's interesting is that each of these pads is an individual solar cell. So then we can hit it with the solar simulator, hit it with light, and we can test the properties. So I think you'll see we put it in this manifold, and that's in our lab, our solar simulator. You'd get, you'd get tan on your hand if you just held it there for a while in front of it. And this is emitting basically the exact, or as close as we can get to um, what's coming out from the sun. So this is really neat, right? Because we, we can make these nanoparticles how we want. We can choose the materials. And you saw how we process it. It's just very basic. But this is, you know, this is as big as our solar cell today. To scale this, is going to take many, many more years and efforts in, in a basic science research setting. But what we're hopefully showing is a starting point. So let me share with you some of the results, which are really encouraging. This is, again, a picture of our reaction. These are vials of our material in solution. So this brownish color is copper sulfide, and this yellowish col color is cadmium sulfide. This inset is a... Uh, what's called a transmission electron microscope image of our nanoparticles. So I was telling you before that we can see these at very small scales. 
And this is how we see them, and this is what our particles look like. We, de we deposit these films, one on top of the other, we put the contacts down, and then we test the solar cells. For anybody who's in the solar industry, they'll be familiar with a curve called an IV curve, a current voltage curve, and this is how we judge whether or not what we're making is good or not. And I'll tell you right now, uh, most people in the PV industry would probably choke at this IV curve. It's not very good. But what it is, is a starting point, like I said, it's a prototype. This particular device is 1.6% efficient. So putting that into context, if you were to buy a silicon cell today, it's about 20% efficient. But they've had a 50-year head start, so I think we can get there. Now, the other thing that's probably more exciting uh, to me about this research has been the deposition of our material on plastic. So we're actually the first demonstration of an all-inorganic nanoparticle solar cell using copper sulfide on flexible substrate. So again, it goes back to our cost equation with the whole encapsulation of a material. The reason we can get away with this is because we have fairly good control of our material, but more importantly, we use very, very little heat in the processing. So as high as we go is about 150 degrees C, which is pretty incredible when you think about the processing for most solar cells. And we're pushing hard to see if we can get past that 1.6%. But this was, uh, this was done. You can read more about it. I put the sources at the bottom of the page. So now, you know, let's talk about iron sulfide, pyrite. It's also known as fool's gold, and it's a very, very interesting compound. A lot of you, I'm sure, played with this material when you were kids, thinking you had gold, but you really didn't. And what we wanted to do was see if we could make a solar cell with this. Now, like I said before, one of the big hurdles for these groups out in Germany in the 80s was that they just couldn't make a pure enough material. Right, we can dig this out of the ground, but that's not, that's not the purity we need. It's going to have these different metal sulfide phases. Um, they fell short. And when you look back at that literature, we, we read everything they wrote. We basically decided that we might give it another shot with nanoparticles because of the purity issue. And we haven't made a, or demonstrated a solar cell yet, but in a forthcoming publication, we basically show that we can make extremely pure material. And this is just an absolutely great result for making pure pyrite because what we've done is we've done it in a very simple way. We can synthesize this molecular precursor and by the addition of a surfactant, um, this is called CTAB, and just water, we heat it up and we make these kind of big blocky cubes of iron sulfide, very pure pyrite. And, you know, we're extremely excited about this result because as soon as we can get this out into the literature, then other people, other labs, can maybe pick this up and push it you know, forward. Because quite honestly, it's been, it's been a challenge to try to coax these into a solar cell. But if it was easy, um, it you know, probably would have been done and it probably wouldn't be worth exploring. But this material, as some of the others, does have this potential, um, that 7 billion people potential. So, let me shift gears before we wrap up. What, what started it as a discussion tonight about how do we get solar in the hands of all these people um, really morphed into a story about research and development, basic science. And you know, I'm, I'm standing up here advocating that we need to put resources towards this. And I'm doing that in part because we've lost a little time. Now, this chart is really fascinating because it takes us back to 1970, and the, the y-axis here is U.S. solar research and development. And that's for both solar heating and cooling, solar thermoelectric, and what I'm talking about, which is photovoltaic, PV. And you see there's a big spike here. That was sort of a reaction to the, the oil crisis back in the late 70s. And then it stays very flat, uh, roughly around $200 million or less up until today. And we can do a little bit with that, but we can't do that much. And, you know, you can say that the momentum was lost, but it's very encouraging that despite that, we've had all this progress in the industry. And I want to show one more chart that's a bit detailed, but it, it, makes, um, it makes one more point, which is this is a chart showing over that same time period the different technologies from multi-junction to silicon to these thin films we discussed to emerging, organic and nano, and that's this little guy right here. 
And what it shows is that these threads have been going for a long time. So those first solar cells, CADTEL, you know, they've been working on that since the late 70s. And it's just today, 30 years later, that we're finally seeing these products come to market. You can appreciate how challenging this has been. But what's a little bit interesting when I compare this chart to the last is that there's been this void for about 20 years where we haven't invested in any new material discovery. Like all the stuff we've talked about, had we started that 20 years ago, we might be in a different situation, but it's not too late. We started this work on nanotechnology solar cells in the late 90s, and that's what we're continuing on. We're building on their success to see if we can demonstrate it with these new non-toxic earth abundant materials. And so I guess that's, that's the pitch. We need a little bit more R&D. So a few concluding remarks. First is the primary two criteria for pervasive adoption, how cheap, how fast. I think that's probably pretty clear. Uh, we're not equipped today. 17,000 terawatt hours is what the world consumes. We are not equipped today to fulfill that with the photovoltaics technologies that are on the market, not in a meaningful time frame. Silicon technologies, for example, are limited by cost and potentially form factor. Thin film technologies may be limited by material abundance. And you know, we haven't really seen this push for new basic science R&D for solar PV in about 20 years. So new approaches are critical, and we've talked about one, nanoscale photovoltaics using these earth abundant materials. We've demonstrated an interesting prototype with copper sulfide and I think a starting point with iron sulfide. So, I'd like to wrap up by saying thank you to all the people that helped support this work. The funding for this work has come from the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Energy, and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, in particular, I've worked very closely with members of the Energy and Resources Group and the Oliver Saltes Group at UC Berkeley. And there's many names here that you can just scan, but without them, none of this work would have been possible. And we were able to kind of put our brains together and get some of this done. So <clears throat> thank you for your attention, and I'd love to take some questions. <clears throat> yeah, in the back. Well, thank you for the question. The question is, um, am I affiliated in any way with NanoSolar? And the answer is no. Um, NanoSolar is an independent company. They're a startup in Silicon Valley. They make um, these SIG cells. And um, they, they are working on a very interesting technology, um, but it's, it's a little different than the direction that I, I would be going. So uh, it's because of the abundance issues I talked about. So they're working on materials that have near-term potential to be absolutely fantastic for getting us in the U.S. to this $2 watt level, but it may not get into the hands of everybody. Next question, right there. You did. So a lot of these rural electrification projects, they just keep it at DC. So that means they run a DC TV, lights, they maybe have a battery, like a lead acid battery backup. So there's a way around that. But if we're going to connect to the grid for the developed world, um, it's unlikely that we'd move off of DC unless we create new DC infrastructure for distribution of electricity. Yeah, you know, there's, there's constant debate about this because I think there are two sides of that camp, the AC advocates and the DC advocates. But right now, what we, we're working with is AC, and so it would take an infrastructure change. And that's not impossible, but um, this is sort of the situation. Let me get one back there.
So, you're right. So the question is, would we that growth that I show from 17,000 up to over 20,000? Could that actually be modified down based on energy efficiency and consumption? It, it could. I was using um, EIA numbers of just a modest 2% growth a year. So, um, but as a point of reference, uh, if we really, if we really believe by 2050 we're going to have 9 billion people on the planet, um, we're, we're still faced with the same challenge. Okay, right there. A fast charging and discharging in a storage, a sense of storage? Yeah. I think he's talking about what I, the discovery. Oh, okay. Well, maybe Don's more equipped to answer that question. Um, yeah, so that, that's a little, that's a different topic. Um, There's information about that on the Berkeley uh, lab website that includes contact. Okay. All right, so I can't keep track of who's had their hand up the longest. But if I fail to call on you, uh, just yell. Go ahead. Um, did your analysis come up with uh, any conclusions of centralized versus distributed production? No. We were just looking at sort of any mode of, of centralized versus distributed. Any mode. Um, how, how pervasive can we go? Yeah, right there. Yes. Uh, one thing that uh, nobody seems to address with this is the toxicity of the element. Sure. Right. Well, seems like there's a potential for a massive uh, distribution of toxic uh, materials. I think that's a really good point. So cadmium is sort of the leading candidate for this type of argument, and um, it's in this first solar material, CAD tell. Uh, this is actually where we started the work. We looked at the toxicity of all elements in the peri periodic table, literally, to see kind of which ones we should knock off the list. Interestingly enough, the ones that got knocked off for toxicity also got knocked off for abundance. So if you look at a copper sulfide or iron sulfide cell, um, you're not faced with that issue. Um, yeah, right here in front. Um, I understand that one of the really big problems with uh, producing solar cells today is because, uh, as you alluded to in your slides, they require so much energy to be manufactured. Um, and you're already starting off at a very, uh, a very deep kind of deficit, energy deficit, when you're starting with these. Um, you, you alluded to the fact that this new technology shows promise of uh, your client being more efficient on the production side. Do you have a ballpark figure about uh, at what efficiency level these things will actually be worth? Will, will, pay for, will be able to create the energy required to reproduce? Well, I mean, interestingly enough, Modern solar cells have an energy payback between two and six dollars, or sorry, two and six years, depending on which, which study you look at. So the energy payback is actually already pretty good because you'd expect, like I said earlier, these solar cells to last above six years, 20, 30 years possibly. Now, if we're talking about a solar cell that's only going to last for two to five years, um, then I think this becomes a much more important point. Okay. So, yeah, right there. Sorry, I'll get you next. Oh, no, I'm going there, and then I'll come back to you. Uh, I lose your plot right. France is down to $2 per kilowatt, and if so, how come? So, well, I know that the majority of France's electricity is nuclear, and they have a very kind of aggressive reprocessing of their nuclear waste, which probably conserves on their ability or their need for new nuclear sources. Well, that wasn't the solar energy. No. That represents where they are now. So, yeah, go ahead. How much, <coughs> how much variation is there in uh, one hour per day for a square meter of uh, receptive surface, uh, depending on latitude and weather? I'm sorry, between a latitude and? Latitude and weather. And weather, okay. So uh, there is a, a pretty large variation, actually. And so... Um, whether you're in the desert in Arizona or in the cloudy environment in Germany, it does make a difference. Um, the, I'd have to look at the exact capacity factors. There might be a swing of about 10% uh, of what you can get out. But then what you do is you play these tricks like tracking. Um, 
And this is sort of where a lot of these solar companies go because if you can still track, you can't get past the cloud cover, but you can work a little bit more with your specific latitude longitude. Yeah. Okay, right there. Yes, you. Yeah. Now, this is a really, really critical point that you raised. Thank you for the comment. So, we're, we're kind of waving our hands a little bit and saying, yes, we can get this in the hands of all these people, 7 billion, great. But at the end of the day, solar or wind or a lot of these renewables are, are non-dispatchable. That means we can't decide when they turn on or turn off. So, all of this has to be coupled with a very sophisticated form of energy storage. And there's... A, If you had a global internet network of, you know, transmission, but so I guess I'll just leave it at that. Storage is probably the answer to your question. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, right there. Um, so all. So what I didn't talk about is where we absorb with these different materials. So all these materials actually do absorb well into the ultraviolet. And it, it just depends on where their energy band gap is. They may not absorb that well, and we may lose a lot of energy there. So it comes back to this idea, can we engineer the materials to have the appropriate energy level to absorb well in all parts of the spectrum? Because the minute you focus on one, you kind of trade off the other. Yeah. Right here, sorry. Okay. Do you see the possibility of developing some type of roadmap that would greatly accelerate the rate of the R and D? It's been about forty years. It has a very accelerated R and D say the human genome project, but you have the decoding was conceptually very simple. But here you have things all over the place. Uh, has anyone but looked back at the research for the last forty years and asked the question, well, how could this have happened much faster and how could we develop a roadmap that would exploit that understanding? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I don't have a great answer for you, but, and I don't know if anybody's actually looking historically to see how we could have done things differently. Um, I do know that a lot of people look at this and say, what if we had this Manhattan Project of solar or a, a spike in research and development? What then? Um, and should we do that now? I think they're planning, you know, in their planning stages, they think about those aspects. Um, you know, I, I think any incremental increase over what we have now could go a long way. So, where was that next question? For another time. Can you just call on them? So, go ahead. Okay. On your previous chart, um, in terms of the most efficient, it looked like there was some work being done at North Carolina State University in the mid 30s in terms of efficiency. Do I read that right? Let me find your North Carolina. Oh, right here. These are multi-junction tandem cells. So these are uh, materials that are a bit more exotic. They have high efficiencies, but by putting them in tandem, we can absorb more of the spectrum. They tend to be very expensive and specialized. And for the most part, they're still used with space applications because the, the power out to weight ratio is ideal for putting this up into space, but recently they're being coupled with solar concentrators to see if they can bring the overall cost down. But that's the type they were working on. Okay, right there. So the exact number is it's somewhere around 23, 24%. Yeah, so what I use is what's called the shock lake quasar limit, which is a theoretical thermodynamic limit of any of these semiconducting compounds. It depends on the band gap of the material, but by taking the band gap, 
we find the theoretical limit. Is that scary? We want to look at the best case scenario. So you're right. It's, if you look at those bars then, then every bar should come down a little bit. It would still actually be pretty high because you saw it was probably four orders or five orders of magnitude above silicon. But then we'd, we'd get killed on the balance of systems or the, all the area-related costs. Yeah, right here. How about the ownership issues, like the university that you're working with? So who owns the, the results of your work? <laughs> you know, it's obviously a huge business. So. Oh, yeah. That, no, they're, they're very uh, aware of that, too. Um, <laughs> the... <laughs> The, the way the IP typically works is we, you know, we, we develop this technology and then the, we've actually done our patents through Lawrence Berkeley Lab and um, I can't remember the exact split but they own some and the inventors own some but it's their responsibility then to go license whatever technology we develop. You know, you got to remember a lot of the ideas come from the researchers but all the facilities that Berkeley, I mean, in Lawrence Berkeley Lab provide us make this possible. So everything from an electron microscope, which could be millions of dollars, to you know just the bench where we mix chemicals. Um, so we're very lucky to be working here. Yes. Yeah, so the efficiency question comes up again. So right now you can purchase a silicon solar cell for 20 plus percent. I think SunPower is leading that charge and I think they probably have a 21, 22 percent solar cell. Theoretically, there's no reason we can't get there with iron sulfide or copper sulfide. Their band gaps happen to be in the exact right place. But it may take us 20 plus years of development. Because look where they started, right? Back in the 70s, these guys were all clustered around, you know, 10, 12 percent. Okay. Who's had their hand up for a while? There's okay, you right there. You were saying that for nanoparticles you can tune the size of the particle to their band gap. So could you do like the equivalent of a multi junction by having different yes. size nanoparticles in your mix and get higher? Efficiency? Absolutely. So we've just discussed one aspect of you know, nanotech, but you're absolutely right. Now I can take the same material, tune the band gaps, and now absorb efficiently at all these different wavelengths with the exact same material. You still have to figure out how you make that multi-junction, and if you have contacts in, in between each of these layers. But the, the beauty is that, you know, maybe the interaction between the particles is a lot more gentle than taking disparate materials. It's a very, it's a very interesting concept. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, but, but somebody, perhaps even in this audience, does. And like I said, the silicon vendors depend on this happening as well. Absolutely. Right back there. That's right. Yeah, so we, we, will, we will not know really until we try to scale this and really rigorously test the stability. Um, metal sulfides have this oxidation issue and they have a kind of this mob mobile cation or anion issue as well. So you've got to really you know, think about those things. But um, I don't think that they would be any less stable than some of the leading uh, thin films right now. But we don't know. We don't know. Right there. Okay, so that I caught it up still up there. If you change all the axes around and stuff, it kind of looks like a mortar ball or stuff. In other words, you've got all these lines that are almost parallel. Right. That are going up, but the efficiency is going up maybe half a percent per year or something like that. Right. Um, are there other strategies? Can you 
Well, the first comment I'd make is that, you know, if, when you couple this with the previous chart, you could probably say that this mod, first of all, you should look at this and say this is a shockingly slow rate of improvement over this three decade span. Now, would additional funding have helped that? We don't know because the, the money wasn't really there during this time period. So it might have been a small number of researchers working on this. Now, we all have to start somewhere. And I can't tell you right now if there's something we can do that will start the tail up top. Um, there may be some tricks you can play with silicon since we know silicon very well. Uh, if you try to make a nanowire or nanoparticle silicon solar cell, there's probably reason to believe we could probably start maybe somewhere around here um, with a brand new cost and processing model. But, um, you know, we're open to ideas. And I think <laughs> if, if you have one. <laughs> um, okay, right here. So a dye-sensitized solar cell, it's a slightly different variety than what we're talking about. Um, we do know a little bit about that. This was an area of research developed by Professor Michael Gretzel out of uh, Switzerland. And this was developed probably about 20 years ago. The dyes tend to be a little bit expensive. And the problem is with these, th there's electrolyte that also has to be part of the architecture. And the problem I've, I've heard, and I don't know that much about it, but what I do know is that the encapsulation and you know, making a stable product has been a little bit difficult. But I know a lot of companies are, are revisiting that because that is already in the 10 plus percent range and we don't have a commercial product. So yeah, right back there. So you could do that, absolutely. Um, splitting water is a whole different ball game. And I think you're going to run into, you know, somebody asked about stability earlier, you're going to run into more of a stability issue when you try to put some of these metal sulfides into water. Um, I don't know really the, the state of the art on that field, but I do know that we have probably have more researchers at Lawrence Berkeley Lab thinking about that problem than we do on photovoltaics. So it's going to be really interesting to see what comes out in the next few years. Okay, we got one standing. All right. Go ahead. What have been the impacts on village cultures when electricity has been? <laughs> <laughs> so I try to familiarize myself as much with the development issues, um, but that's a whole other field of study, and I really can't answer that question um, or have a strong opinion on it. But I will tell you this. When I visited this village, the, the neighboring village did have solar cells installed after about six months. And um, they expressed to me that it really changed their life. And it wasn't the Chinese government that did it. It was the German government. They put those solar cells in. And it was the German um, taxpayer that was subsidizing that. But they were able to run a light and a TV. And the TV turned out to be a very important part of their sort of globalization. If you, if you could, there's probably a better term for it. But they really, it opened them up to the world. And they had 30 state. They have more stations than I do with Comcast here in Berkeley. <laughs> so, I mean, I really think they appreciate it. Now, the cultural interactions—that's a whole other—that's a whole other um, ball of wax, and I really can't address. Right there. Yeah. So. With respect to storage, you, you run into a lot of the same problems we talked about, abundance of materials, because you're constrained to lithium and cobalt in this. Um, lead acid, uh, you don't want to do a deep discharge on lead acid, so it may not be appropriate for a grid scale storage solution. But on the horizon, there are these metal air batteries, which basically use just air and zinc. Now, the problem with these is they, may, they still haven't made them rechargeable. These are some of the issues they're dealing with. But if they can figure that out, then and the energy density doesn't matter for stationary storage, which would be the case with the grid. You know, transportation is a whole different game. But some of these metal air batteries could have that potential. Maybe more potential than the nickel metal hydrides or the lithium ions or the lead acids, as you mentioned. 
right here. Right. And I'm wondering um, at what efficiency level, right. considering that, does it become practical? So, a quick answer if, if the area related costs don't change, that means the whole structure around a solar cell changes it not at all. And it, we're just talking about the active material, the breaking point's around 5 or 6% efficient. Right back there. So the one thing we, we, can, we could talk about is recycling. And a lot of, you know, if you look at the, the guys in the CAD tell business, what they do, what they have been doing is by buying out these old abandoned copper mines in Mexico to get their solar. They're becoming a mining company as much as they are a solar company. So w they are really interested in your, your question because they need to be able to recycle and reprocess spent solar cells. But now, if these solar cells are on the roofs for 50 plus years, um, at what point do we start recycling those and recapturing those materials? And the one thing I'd say is, you know, solar cells are a hog of material, and this is the issue. You know, the productivity we get out of the semiconductor industry with silicon is much, much greater per area, square area, that we get with silicon for solar cells, because we have to make a lot of it to capture the sun's rays. Life cycle cost analysis, there are studies, especially with the cadmium, um, cadmium-based materials. But um, outside of that, hopefully that answered your question partly. All right, I think we have time for maybe one more, two more. Let's go two more. Okay, right here. If you wanted me to bring in a solar cell. It's a square inch. It's exactly the same size I showed in the video. So I should have brought some. I, I can visit me in the lab. I'll show you. And then <laughs> we'll hook up a really low power light bulb. <laughs> All right, one, one more question. And um, I want to call on someone who hasn't had a chance yet. So right there in the blue shirt. Mm -hmm. But like an inch, uh, is there any reason why it has to be a square? Could it not be like a line, uh, a wire? And could the grid itself be a collector? Wow. <laughs> Thank you for that question. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're, you're demonstrating some really interesting insight because when we, we do this, we process it in this way just because it's how we know and how we can kind of do things quickly in the lab. But ultimately, what we want to do is put these things in solution and act as ink. And with an inkjet printer, we can put down the lines. And um, so absolutely, for this to succeed, we can't process it the way we do it in the lab. And there may be challenges with that, though. And I think companies like NanoSolar who are trying to do this or have tried to do this run into issues with the uniformity of the material when you deposit it that way. There are all these like physics issues that come up when you process it in a different way. But 100%, that's exactly what we would like to do. So I'll stick around for a few more minutes if uh, anybody has some further questions. But thank you.